Welcome to the WMNF Afternoon Call-In Show, the last call. I'm Sean Canan. In a moment, we'll open up the phone lines to take your calls at 813-239-9663. You can also email your questions or comments to dj at wmnf.org. The Tampa Bay area is home to hundreds of refugees, people who are not safe in their home countries and are trying for a new life here. This Saturday, the Tampa Bay Area Refugee Task Force is presenting World Refugee Day at Jefferson High School in West Tampa. And today I have two guests who will answer your questions about refugees and about refugee issues. Rubis Castro is an administrator at Lutheran Services of Florida, and Joseph Germain is the pastor at Temple Terrace Baptist Church. Now, thank you both for joining me this afternoon on Last Call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for joining us. And, and Pastor Germain, I want to start out by asking you, your church is a large international ministry and it serves a number of refugees who have settled in the Temple Terrace and North Tampa areas. Can you give our listeners an idea of where those refugees came from and why they left their countries? Uh, right now we have um, refugees that uh, come from Burma, from various countries in Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, Congo, of course, we've got Cuban refugees, and they pretty much come from all over. And um, most of them are coming because of difficulty at home. Either they are trying to escape religious or political persecution, and they're looking for a place to have a new home. Can you, is there, are there specific conflicts in Eritrea or in the Congo, or are, is that what it is? Is it mostly war, or is, is po- can poverty also be a, a reason? Yeah, in, in the case of the refugees, it, it's mainly mainly war, but of course there could be there could be other issues. Ruby. Yes, um, the refugees, the United Nations, they're the ones that decide uh, what country, the present situation, if they're going to be refugees. They have to have been have a founded uh, fear that uh, for their life, and they've gone to another country. And that's when then the United Nations goes in and then they start interviewing the refugees and then they they decide with the host country if this is in in fact a refugee case and then they declare them refugees. That's the first part of it. It Sounds like there might be a second part or? Yes. Tell us more. Then each refugee has to go through a lot of screening. The United Nations will do a screening and to verify that that fear that they have that for it could be their religion, it could be their nationality, it could be their race, it could be political affiliation, social affiliation, that their life is in danger and they cannot stay. I mean, nobody really wants to leave their country. And the only reason that they leave everything behind is because of fear of their life. If you'd like to join this conversation about refugees, you can call 813-239-9663. You can also email us at dj at wmnf.org. And we're going to take our first call now. It's Bernard in Dade City. Hi, Bernard. Very good. Do you have a question or a comment? All right, thanks so much for that call, Bernard. And if you'd like to join the conversation, 813-239-9663 or w- dj at wmnf.org if you'd like to email us. Um, and you, you mentioned Burma, Pastor. Uh, the situation in Burma is changing now or potentially changing. Uh, it, has it happened recently enough that you're noticing a change, a fewer refugees or or are these is, does it take a long time for the situation to change well we've we definitely have a have a slowdown in the amount of refugees coming from Burma um, one the situation on the ground in, in their country is getting better um, but of course too the, the economic situation when they come to the United States and they trying to find a new life it's very difficult for jobs and, and so forth so it, I think it's both Ruby yes the other reason that there's been a slowdown in refugees in general is because there's now a second screening that has been done. Um, a lot of people don't understand a refugee goes through a lot before they're declared a refugee. Once the United Nations declared it, then they do background screenings, they do a lot of medical screenings, and they verify a lot of information, and then they do security screening. And now there's a second 
and some of, in some cases they do even DNA screenings to ensure that their family members, that they stay there at their families, they have family in DC. Now, you say that there's a slowdown. Could that mean potentially because of all this screening that there are people who are legitimately in danger who are getting turned away at our borders? Well, actually, a refugee, remember, they're in, a, in another country, and they're in refugee camps. So, I mean, conditions that they li live are not the best, because they're in third world countries usually. So the host countries, they're having a hard time themselves. Uh, so normally, within the with refugee camps, sometimes they might have some danger, but they're not in, in danger where, where they left their country from. I think our listeners might be interested in hearing about the stories of refugees, of of, of an example of, of refugees who have left their home countries and have made it eventually to the United States, uh, can either one of you uh, recount something that, that you've heard uh, about a refugee? Um, if, um, I'll start with Brian. Um, several years ago when the Somali refugees <coughs> arrived, um, I was privileged to go to the airport to pick up one of the single moms with four kids. Uh, her husband had been uh, killed in the war in, in Somalia. Uh, they walked for many, many, many weeks to get to Kenya, and they were in a refugee camp for 15 years. Uh, finally, they came to America. Uh, we picked them up. We had an apartment for them. And as soon as we took them to the apartment, we showed them the small apartment. And when she saw the stove, she started crying. And I didn't understand. I thought she didn't like it. So I asked our interpreter, you know, why is it that she's crying? And he said, that now she's not going to be raped, that every time she had to go get wood in a refugee camp, she would get raped. And that stove meant, I mean, we take for granted, and this is something that shocked me forever. And I lived in Somalia, and I, I never would have thought that this is something that a Somali could have told me and shared with me, that she had been raped in a refugee camp. Oh, wow. Um, so you, the stove is kind of emblematic, maybe, of what we take for granted in this country. You do set set refugees up. Once they come to the country, you mentioned going to the airport, picking them up, and bringing them to an apartment. Uh, what What is their life like in that apartment? What is they? Uh, you help them find jobs and so forth. Get, tell us about once they're here, once they have refugee status and they're settling in, what, what would life be like for a typical refugee family? Well, it's, it's very intense for the first 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, the State Department requires us to do a lot of things. A lot of orientations, we have to get them to get medicals, physicals, children enrolled in schools, getting their social security cards, uh, uh, their, their eligibility for any benefits that they have. Uh, orientation, a lot of the, them, they don't understand that in America, the police is a good person. And so we bring in the police, the sheriff's department, so that they get orientation. Uh, we try to explain uh, how to go in, in a bus, so we teach, our staff teaches them to the, connect them. And we can't do it alone. We do a lot of services through with other agencies, and that's where Pastor Joseph comes in, and he, he can share what they provide in his uh, church. Well, the way we, we do is to try to partner with the community and really, really try to help these people. Imagine you come into a new country. In many cases, you do not know the language, and you're trying to navigate the system. So we help them. We help them with um, learning English. We, we, we help them in just trying to figure out where to go in terms of health care, government services, help them get food, um, anything that we can to really help them, help them settle in here in the United States. Are there people who think that they're, you know, they seek refugee status here and they think they're going to settle here and then just can't take it? They just, uh, this is not the place for them. What happens then? Um, very few far, usually what happens is if they ha they didn't know that they have a family member in the United States and through all the media now, they find out that they have a family member, like for instance some of our Somali Bantus, they found out that they had family in Georgia and Tennessee and they relocated because they had family members. Um, in my 22 years at Lutheran Services, I can count with my hands how many have, have gone back to their country. Usually when they leave their country, they don't go back. Normally, uh, once, like for instance, the Bosnians, once now that they can return, they go visit. But now they have roots here. Their children were uh, have gone to school. They're in college. Sometimes they already got married. So they're American citizens, and they're contributing to the United States. So they don't they they don't want to go back. They just go to visit if they can. 
the, the Bosnians, there's a, that's a large refugee population in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, why is that? What was the conflict? I mean, I think people know what the conflict was, but, but um, when, did this, when did we start seeing a large number of Bosnians in, in the Tampa Bay area? And maybe why Tampa Bay as opposed to Cleveland or something? Um, to start with, the United Nations, when they de decide that it's a refugee, then they come to the State Department, comes to the United States, and they have what they call Volunteer Agency, like for short. And Lutheran Immigration Resettlement in Baltimore is our national agency. And they determine what things the community has for the different uh, refugees that are coming. So they sit at the table in Washington and say, okay, these refugees need uh, X, Y, and C. And then the national agencies from Lutheran Services, Catholic Charities, World Relief, they decide, well, we know that in Tampa there's a lot of services. They have uh, employment for the refugees, career lettering for the refugees. They have uh, counseling for the refugees, and since these people have gone through it. So it depends. The Bosnians came um, after the war. Uh, once they, the United Nations declared them, then they started coming. Um, and a lot of them did uh, uh, move to San Pete, and then we do have some in the Tampa Terrace area. We accept that. And once you get a foothold where there's a small number of refugees, then they have family members or friends maybe that, that also come and so kind of acts as a, as a attractor, like a magnet. And I think that um, in the country, I think people might be familiar with the Somali population in Minnesota or maybe the, um, I don't know if these were refugees, but you know, there's a, in Dearborn, Michigan, there's a large Arab population. I'm not, I don't think they were refugees, but it's just kind of, an, it, it, that's how it happens. It, there's a, it's like a, a foothold and then, and then more come from that same culture. Um, and, and Pastor, what uh, in your in your community, in your church, I'd like to hear more stories about the people who came from Africa there, um, because you said you mentioned a, a few African countries. Um, give us an example then of, of a refugee story that from your church. We have right now a couple of families that um, came from Congo and um, ended up as refugees in Kenya. Came from very very difficult life, um, civil war. Um, I have one young lady who was give, telling her story. Um, she was raped twice. A cousin of hers was kidnapped and it barely escaped for their lives. They finally uh, made it to Kenya. Now they are with us here in the United States. And I mean, they are just so thankful that they are here. And basically all they want is the opportunity for, for a new life. And um, what we are doing is to help them. You know, of course, they have a, a, a big language barrier and we have an English program at the, at the church that they can come um, Monday to Friday, 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock. They can learn English, they can learn um, basic job skills, and um, really help themselves so that they can look forward to a better life for themselves and for their families. That's the voice of Joseph Germain. He's pastor at Temple Terrace Baptist Church. We're also speaking with Rubies Castro, an administrator at Lutheran Services of Florida. And there are guests today because we're talking about World Ref Refugee Day, and that will be celebrated by the Tampa Bay Area Refugee Task Force this Saturday at Jefferson High School in West Tampa. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can call 813-239-9663, or you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. My name is Sean Canan, and I'm the host of Last Call. It's 546 in the afternoon, and you're listening to 88.5 FM in Tampa. And um, the, when these refugees settle in the area, they're expected to get jobs, just like you know, they'll get jobs. What kinds of careers are you finding that the, that the refugees are gravitating towards or are, are skilled in, or are, are, you know, what, what kind of jobs do they end up taking? Well, it depends on the refugee. Uh, we have refugees that are professional in their countries uh, that speak the language, so a lot of them are able to go into their field. For instance, we've had a lot of refugees that in their countries were accountants, and we have a program with the Department of Children and Families that it's called Career Lottery, and we help them uh, take a course in their field so that they learn the, the language, their vocabulary their, for the accounting and we help them translate their, their degrees, and then we try to get them in a field of accounting, and it might be bookkeeping, so that way the company sees that they are somebody that they want to hire, and then they prove themselves. Uh, now there's some, like for instance, that will have, that they don't speak uh, uh, English, or some of them don't know how to even read or write in their own language. 
With those, we have a program that's called the SEED program, again, with the Department of Children and Family Refugee Services, and we provide uh, basic training either in landscaping, in janitorial services, in um, how to do sushi. And then once we do the training, we, do, we put them on the job training in the different companies that are willing to provide them jobs. Our staff teaches them how to take the bus to go. We try to um, put them in, in places where there are other refugees that have cars and they do carpooling. So it depends on the refugees. So we have all the way from people. Uh, we just had year uh, when the uh, earthquake, we had a former refugee that had been a doctor and he went through everything and he became again a doctor here. And when the earthquake, he went back to Haiti to help. They're still there helping. So it depends on um, their their background and what their skills and, and education level is. The Iraq War, when that started, there was a at first it was very slow in for the U.S. to accept refugees. There were millions of displaced people in the in the Iraq War, and at first the U.S. was reticent in taking refugees. But then I I, I noticed in the maybe in the middle of the decade. We were getting more and more refugees. Are there Iraqi refugees settling in the Tampa Bay area? And um, is what's what's that like for them? Um, a lot of them uh, are resettling in, in the, mainly in the Temple Terrace area. And it's really hard because a lot of them worked with our military and they were tr interpreters and translators for them. And a lot of them lost their entire family. Uh, we've had some of them that have come by themselves because they lost all their family. And it's been very difficult for them and challenging because uh, in their country they were very well known, they had prestigious uh, positions. Um, then when they started helping the Americans doing translations, all of a sudden they were targets. So it's been challenging for them. Uh, and unfortunately a lot of ignorance, a lot of people unfortunately don't understand that they are here because of fear of their life also. Are there conflict areas right now where you hadn't been seeing refugees from a certain area, but recently there are more and more that are coming from a particular area? For example, in Syria, is that on the radar yet? Not really, not yet. Because remember, it, it, the United Nations, it's such a lengthy process. Now, with that said, they can speed up, and that's why sometimes you say, how could those Somali ones who have been 15, 20 years in Kenya? Because what happens is, all of a sudden, there was a crisis in Sudan. So they brought the lost boys of Sudan. Then all of a sudden there was another crisis in the Congo. So they brought. So depending on the crisis, sometimes then unfortunately, the same thing happens with the Burmese. Some of the Burmese that we brought, children were born there and they're 16 years old, and that's all they know is a refugee camp. 813-239-9663 or DJ at WMNF dot O R G. Can either of you give me an example of the scale, of the scope of the, the, the refugee issue in the United States? How many refugees are there in the U.S.? How many are in Florida? How many in Tampa Bay? Um, in, in the Tampa Bay region, we resettle approximately, and again, it depends, uh, about 500. There are several agencies that do resettlement in the Tampa Bay region. When I say Tampa Bay region, I, I include also St. Pete. Catholic Charities, Coptic Charities, and Gulf Coast Jewish Family Services, and Lutheran Services, we all resettle. Uh, Lutheran Services is the, is the largest one, and on, on an average, we resettle anywhere from 300 to up to even 800, again, depending on the situation, depending on if they do additional security. Uh, for instance, after 9-11, we just about had zero refugees for about almost a year. Pastor Joseph, I, I, I'd like to find out what's the most surprising country uh, from which you've, you, you've met refugees, in, maybe in your parish. Um, you know, we, we expect, I guess, expect some from certain countries like Cuba, for example. But where is, have you had an experience where you were kind of surprised that there was a refugee from a particular country? Well, I know the Burmese have become, I mean, they are a large group. When I first mm -hmm. met them, which was five, six years ago, I was surprised to see that they were in Tampa. Um, more recently, um, the Ethiopians, um, the Eritreans, of course, the Iraqis and the Iranians, and even um, in, from Nepal, they've also had a, a good group of, of, of refugees there. Yeah. And, and Rubis, I'd like to ask you the same question. Is there any place that, you know, that 
I mean, maybe, are there any Western um, European countries that, that refugees come from? Any, uh, like South America?